Okay, we're back. Uh, what do you do in a day working from home? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I know what Kelly is wondering about now because <laughs> a normal day for me working, if I don't have too much to do, I'm getting up like seven thirty in the morning. No, set actually seven o'clock, and I drive my girlfriend to a train station who goes to university in Oslo. Uh, so when Sandra is sent to school, I go home and get Alexander for to go to school. And then I have a cup of coffee. And uh, I'm supposed to get to the office, but uh, if I turn <laughs> on the television and there he is, Dr. Phil. <laughs> but isn't the office in another room? <laughs> yes, it is. It's just uh, one stair up. And um, sometimes I just... Uh, it's like a getting hypnotized by this daytime television <laughs> and uh, it's hard to turn off <laughs> you're not watching soap operas are you <laughs> no I'm, I'm not i have an addiction to a norwegian soap opera but, uh, but that doesn't start before 7 30 in the evening <laughs> <laughs> okay let's see here let's see here how's contest promoting going uh, well great actually um I, I, I am at a certain level that I can't seem to extend and get any higher myself. But I have found myself a new partner now who has a circle of, uh, of people that me approach for sponsorship and so on that lays uh, a layer above me. So I'm very excited for the upcoming season and we certainly going to move from to a different level in Norway now. Alright, um, let's see here, how did your kidney transplant affect your life and not just uh, physically? Well, uh, I, there's two things, I, I knew it was coming, the kidney failure, because I had a kidney failure all the way since 2000, but kidneys uh, you don't need to have them 100% to have 100% function of what you mm -hmm. need. So it comes so gradually, and um, my kidneys were actually working still, still worked fine as long as I competed. Uh, strangely enough, when I stopped competing, that's when the failure really started. Wow. Uh, but um, looking back now, uh, I think it made me stronger. It had a huge impact on my life, and uh, sadly enough, my ex-wife Lena, who is dead now, she actually took it so much harder than me, even though she knew it was coming. And uh, I think that actually led to her disease that I killed her in the end. Wow. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm a very positive person, so I try to make something positive out of everything that happens to me. So when I was sick, you know, I tried. I knew I had kidney failure. I couldn't do anything about that. The only thing I could do is do the best out of the situation. Sure. And I did that and I trained very hard, I was eating very good and healthy and uh, even at my sickest and uh, just before the operation I still weighed about 260 pounds and that was trying to lose as much weight before the operation as possible. Sure. But uh, I was relatively in good, good condition at the time and uh, yeah, I didn't feel too bad, but uh, as I said, it probably had a harder effect on the people around me than myself. Yeah. Um, now, uh, speaking about that, how did you deal with the grief process? Has it How has it changed your life? How is moving forward? And is there anything else you want people to know about it? Well, when you come to a situation where you have somebody that you really care about and love uh, getting sick, uh, it's uh, of course very hard. And uh, we went into a mental, mental health problem. And, and in Norway, I don't know about the States, but in Norway, that's something you don't talk about. But being me, I, hadn't, I didn't have a choice because everybody knew me and everybody knew what was happening around me. She was very sick at the time and she was at hospital. But from, from for a very extended period of time uh, when she had her manic face and uh, I knew it was a possibility for her to to die afterwards and by 
by her own choice because that happens to 25% of all bipolar people that wow. she was suffering from. But of course it was a huge shock when it, when it happened. And the process uh, after that was, it was very tough because for the first time in my life I felt I didn't control the situation. Uh, there was nothing I could do. Uh, she was dead and I was scared. I was so scared. The first week I was there alone with my with my 10 year old son, a nine year at the time. Yeah. And uh, I, I, was, I was so frustrated because I, I, I surely didn't know what to do. And uh, we had a financial crisis, mm -hmm. so to say, because a part of her disease was uh, spending all of her money. Uh, but uh, after a few weeks only, I I started to 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 see more and more clearly what I had to do and use my brain as I always used it, you know, to work for me, not against me, and uh, try to look what could I do. And for me, I the people who knows me know that I love to talk, and I have no problems talking about my problems either. And I have so many good friends. A lot of people say that in situations like this is when you learn who your true friends yeah. are. Yeah. And for me, that was an unbelievable good experience because I wasn't surprised anybody turning their back against me. I was more surprised about people that I didn't, really didn't thought would help me and support me who actually did. People reaching out for from, you. I want to thank everybody from all around the world for all the supportive mails. The messages on the Facebook, the offering of living everywhere, sharing people's houses to get away from stuff. Uh, I don't know if I had the time to thank everybody, but I can do that now. Yeah. And that meant so much for me when I saw all those people who cared about me and Alexander. That was uh, one of the things that warmed my heart the most of the things I ever experienced in my life. All the people that cared about us. and. Uh, when people asked my friends, my very close friends, if they should call me or not, I said, call me because the telephone is the easiest tool in the world. If I, if I felt like speaking, I could just take the telephone and talk. Yeah. If I didn't feel like talking, you know, I could just no, leave it. Yeah. So it was very simple. And I truly appreciate everything that was said and done around me at that point. Okay. Let's see here. How do you feel about Strongman today? And what do you, who do you think the best guys are? Well, uh, the change of the scenes anyway, because uh, when I competed, uh, we dominated people from Scandinavia with Magnus, Aula, Virtanen, myself, and René Minquist from Denmark as well, for that sake. And uh, now it turns to be an East European and Amer American game at the moment. But uh, I find it more, more interesting now because it's a lot of new guys coming from everywhere. We have uh, Stefan who's coming from Iceland, mm -hmm. from Norway as well. We have Espen, we have mm -hmm. uh, Rickard, and now the return of, uh, of the Hulk, Mario uh, <laughs> Haugen as well. Yeah. So we're up for some very, very interesting time in Strongman, I hope. Yeah, it's very competitive. So, okay. Let's see here. What's next for you to cover? Uh, right now, we are waiting to get over to the for the expo scene to do the World Strongest Man Super Series final here in Gothenburg. And after that is uh, an event in... Yeah, well, it's the Arnolds. It's the Arnolds. Yes. So that probably will be our next goal. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see here. Anything else to promote your biz, sponsors, or anything else? Uh, no, not that I can think about right now. <laughs> it's quite early in the morning. Yeah, I know. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sven. I, Sven, I really appreciate that. I mean, that was a lot. To, thanks for answering those questions. Thank you, guys. And uh, hopefully see you soon at the Arnolds. If anybody want to come over and say hi, I'm there. I might look scary, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks.